Well, welcome everyone to the Global Mangrove Alliance Science to Support Carbon Accounting in Mangroves webinar with Professor Catherine Lovelock. I'm Dr. Chris Brown from Global Wetlands Project and Science Co-Lead uh, of the Global Mangrove Alliance. And I see we've just been joined by Tom Worthington as well, who's the other Science Co-Lead. Uh, so today we have a short presentation about 30 minutes from Kath about her work on carbon accounting. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for some Q&A with our expert. Now, in Australia, it's traditional to pay respect to country and acknowledge the Indigenous people of the lands on which we work. So I'd like to pay my respects to the Palawar people of Tasmania and ex extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and acknowledge that around the world, many Indigenous populations have been displaced by colonialism and part of our work in conservation is to help uh, see how we can better engage with Indigenous people and um, further land rights. Uh, so I'd just like to prefer, introduce Professor Kath Lovelock before she starts. Um, she's a global expert on the impacts of climate change on coastal wetlands and also on the role of coastal ecosystems in mitigating climate change. She's led the development of the Blue Carbon Method for Australian Carbon Credit Unit Scheme and she was also an Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change lead author for the Wetlands chapter. She's published literally hundreds of academic papers, um, including seminal papers on uh, carbon in mangroves, effects of climate change on blue carbon, and effects of sea level rise on mangroves. She's currently a fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences and holds an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship on the restoration and blue carbon in coastal wetlands. So over to you, Catherine. Yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing about uh, carbon accounting. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. And hello, everybody. Today I'm coming from the lands of the Turbul and Jagera people, and I pay my respects to their uh, ancestors and leaders, current and emerging. So um, today I'm going to talk about science to support carbon accounting in mangroves. Uh, in mangrove conservation and restoration, that should be uh, an addition and um, to that slide. But, you know, why we want to think about carbon accounting in mangroves because they're important for climate regulation. That's the ecosystem service that we are uh, valuing here. So mangroves, they capture CO2, they store it in biomass and soils, and they have actually very, well, relatively low methane emissions. So that makes them also uh, uh a, uh, they don't contribute too much to the global warming um, of the uh, atmosphere. Okay, so the topics I'm going to cover today, I'm going to do a brief introduction, talk about some of the basics of uh, carbon accounting, and then like really I'm going to talk about the steps you might take in deciding what science you might need if you're going to undertake some kind of project with carbon accounting. I'm going to talk about monitoring changes in cover briefly because Tom's here and we could have a whole webinar talking about um, monitoring mangroves from space and using other techniques. And then uh, I'll talk about assessing changes in carbon stocks and fluxes. And then finally, just finish up with some discussion on uncertainty and reducing uncertainty uh, in response to a question that we had beforehand and because it's just fundamental when we get into uh, carbon accounting. So accounting for carbon is useful for many purposes, right? So you can use it to describe progress towards uh, meeting national emissions targets, and that's done with greenhouse gas inventories, usually national. You can use it to describe the outcome of projects that aim to reduce emissions that generate carbon credits. And actually, we're going to probably spend most of our time there. And then you can describe outcomes of projects that aim to reduce emissions that can be used to support environmental claims, you know, things like that we're carbon neutral. And, you know, those three different, you know, purposes that you might have really mean that, you know, you might need different kind of science in, in or well, different kinds of approaches um, depending on what you want to do, right? So if we just go to National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, so we talk about that for a moment. You know, countries produce national inventory submissions or reports that they submit to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. They use these things called common reporting tables. They use guidance. The 2006 guidelines is often used. And then there's a wetland supplement that's used and also another document, the 2019 refinement 
in in these guidelines, they have tier one approaches to tier three approaches. And I'm I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with these co concepts, but tier one values are things like global mean values of key parameters, like methane emissions from mangroves or rice or, you know, some other kind of land use, right? But they're usually sort of really coming out of the literature and just one big mean, right? And they're often these, you know, the, the National Greenhouse Gas Inventories are big scale, right? So they have quite a different feel. And uh, this is just a, I'll put this in the slide just in, just to remind us what, you know, tier one to tier three is if you don't know. So you can, you know, have a look at the video afterwards and read all the words. Okay, so the second one is projects for carbon credits. Here, a carbon credit usually or some kind of, whether it's a certificate or a credit, often it's one unit is one tonne of CO2E, right? So one tonne CO2. It's used in carbon trading where um, carbon credits are sold and bought in markets. And there's a range of different standards that offer tools to implement uh, these kinds of projects that generate carbon credits. So standards, and you can see a bunch of them on the bottom. There's the gold standard, Plan Vivo provides a standard, and most of you are probably familiar with the Verified Carbon Standard or the VCS that comes from Vera. And then I've got the Australian government down there too because we have a, a carbon market where we have an Australian carbon credit unit, right? So each of these standards has a whole different series of methods and methods are like recipes you have to follow to, you know, cook up the carbon credits, if you like. Um, you know, that you have to register projects. There's verification and auditing. You know, they have a whole series of processes uh, associated with them. And usually, um, you know, these methods require some kind of local data, Right. The projects are moderate to small, so up to thousands of hectares. And there's a very, you know, the, the the carbon accounting is held to a very high standard. That's the that's the point here. You know, if you look at a carbon project cycle, and this is from TerraCarbon, thank you very much, TerraCarbon. Um, you know, usually you're using a lot of science in that feasibility design monitoring kind of space. So in the beginning parts of these projects and then there's the issuing carbon credit sales and so on, right? So we're really interested in, you know, often the science in this sort of feasibility and design phase. And then there's this certification to support environmental claims. Now I'm not going to talk much about them. They're similar to carbon credit standards and methods, but they're often more flexible. And there's a ton of them, so many different certifications. Actually, I find it confusing, which is why the confusing face there. They're also, um, you know, moderate to small scale projects. Um, the certification of claims of environmental stu stewardship, things like, you know, we are carbon neutral, they're actually come under quite a lot of scrutiny re re recently. And I believe that these will be held to, you know, higher standards possibly in the future, making carbon accounting possibly even more important to do it well. So the basics of carbon accounting, we are not, um, we're not working off monitoring CO2 or other greenhouse gases from, you know, directly in the atmosphere. So I, I just like this slide. It's a methane plume, right, detected from space. And, you know, this would be beautiful, right, if we could have all different lands and understand exactly their exchange from the atmosphere by measuring them from space. But that's not the way we do it. We actually use bottom-up approaches. So we infer what is happening in the atmosphere from uh, changes in land use and their carbon stocks and greenhouse gas fluxes associated with those. So. Um, we're dealing, we're, you know, we're taking a landscape view and we're looking at, over time, changes in the area of different land types and the carbon stocks in those land types so we know what's lost and gained and also the fluxes associated with those different land types. And, um, you know, that's usually in megagrams or tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year. 
And sometimes that approach is called the annual gain loss approach because we're talking about annual fluxes. So here's some quick examples, right? Using a stock change approach. Let's say mangrove cover decreased by 1,000 hectares and that mangrove was burned, right? The, the wood was all burned up. So biomass burning at IPCC tier one is about 150 tonnes CO2 per hectare. And we're going to assume that the soil stock stayed the same. And so the emissions are probably around 150,000 tonnes CO2, right? So if we do something like an annual flux, we've got 200 hectares of mangroves that establishes in five years. IPCC tier one CO2 accumulation rate says six tonnes of CO2 per hectare per year in the soil and 30 tonnes in the biomass. And over five years, we've, we've you know, if we look at those fluxes, we've gained 36 or we've stored 36,000 tonnes of uh, CO2. So the problem with it, these are using tier one values and they have really high uncertainty for any particular site, right? We can do these big sort of calcs, um, but the uncertainty is somewhere between 20 and 200%, right? So that is obviously not going to cut it for a carbon project where you are uh, guaranteeing that that project in the mangroves, whether you're growing one or conserving one, is actually producing those CO2 um, uh, removals in the atmosphere. So what would I say the first steps for understanding the science you need is really clarity about your purpose. So you've got to decide what you're doing, you know. Are you, are you planning on doing a verified carbon standard project to generate carbon cre credits or are you just or are you wanting to improve the national greenhouse gas inventory? Or are you engaged in method development, which is something that we've done in Australia? We have to decide what carbon pools are in scope and what greenhouse gases are in scope, you know. So you really have to understand which what things you need to operate. What's the scale of the project and what land types are involved? Because you may not only have to think about the mangrove, but the baseline conditions as well. So that could be abandoned rice agriculture, aquaculture, grazing land, you know, some other kind of um, uh, ecosystem. And then you have to know what kind of level of, of certainty you need or what kind of level of uncertainty can you tolerate. And then there's all the other issues, right, you know, things like stakeholders and budgets and, you know, all the other constraints that you might have. So I wanted to say, of course, that on, online on the Global Mangrove uh, Alliance website, there's the restoration guidelines. And module one talks a lot about all of these kinds of questions, right? So this is a great resource if you just want to start thinking about it and you need some general um, guidelines about how to go forward. It has things like this. So this is about choosing a standard from all of the, the standards or all of the methods, or actually you should say choosing a method, but all of the methods that are available under the under VERA, and it takes you through and tells you, you know, or at least gives you the choices and the pathways to understand what might be appropriate for what you want to do, right? So there's some good um, material there in the restoration guidelines. Um, but if I had to, um, so just to reiterate, right, the science you need depends on your goals and the standards that and the standard that you choose, whether you choose VCS gold standard, whether you're working under Red Plus or the Australian government method, right? But in general, I would say for carbon market projects, you need local data with high certainty. You have to decide: do you need to measure pools uh, and fluxes on site? Can you use data from past work from the literature? Um, can you use models or proxies? Uh, and what's appropriate for the standard that you've chosen? And can you use IPCC default values, those T tier one values, right? So there's all these, there's actually a lot of moving parts here. And I don't want you to be discouraged by that. I just want to um, point out that you really need to know 
the requirements of the thing that you're getting into. So this is an example from VM0033, which is the method um, uh, offered under the VCS under Vera, right? And it these are sort of like um, sort of grabs from the that method. And uh, for example, if in the baseline emissions they have a separated, you can you have to think about calculating your baseline emissions and then your project emissions. And for the baseline, they say things you can use things. This is for CO two emissions from eroded soil. You can use proxies, published values, default factors, models. You know, like they provide a lot of flexibility in what you can do there. But when you get to the project, the vegetation cover must be determined by common techniques in field biology, i.e. you've got to measure it, right? But then for soils, the VCS, the, the VM0033 says you can use proxies, published values, default values, models, or field-collected data. So the point here is that Really, you've got to work through the documents to understand what you need to do, right? That's the that's the big um, take home here. And I suppose one thing I think about it a lot, and there is guidance, you know, um, provided on the Mangrove Alliance website where we talked about um, looking at uh, um, the risks of climate change and how you do climate smart restoration and conservation. And almost all of these carbon accounting methods require you to think about sea level rise. And that's because we anticipate that sea level rise is going to have big impact on these kinds of projects going forward. So this is the um, the instructions from VM0033. It says you've got to use the non-permanence risk tool to assess uh, the likelihood or to assess what you think is going to happen to your mangrove project, your mangrove carbon project over time. And so, um, you know, establishing the geographic boundaries is really important and how they might change with sea level rise. And this is the instructions that sit within VM0033, uh, just really quite detailed assessment of what you have to, um, or description of what you have to do. So this is the non-permanence risk scoring tables. And uh, there's a video, of course, so that's great. Um, but these are, um, you know, this this is a part of the science that you need to consider when you're going to embark upon one of these carbon crediting projects. It looks scary. It's actually not that bad, you know, but it's probably if you're going to have, if you're going to do one of these projects, I think it really um, speaks to the need to collaborate with your local scientists um, if you can, because you know you've you've actually got quite a lot of uh, things and concepts to work through. So this is the bit where I get into mon monitoring the change in mangrove cover, which is essential for um, any project because you have to know whether you're uh, increasing in cover or decreasing in cover or staying the same. Right? And of course, the Global Mangrove Watch is an amazing resource. Uh, for this, you know, at a big, at, again, at quite a large scale. But um, local mapping, uh, whether it's using high-resolution satellite imagery or drone, done with drones or other methods is really important. I, I don't want to talk much about this because there are many people who are much more qualified than I to talk about this kind of thing, but it's also very important to get these numbers right. You have to understand how your project changes. So this is the sort of like basics of the, you know, we're going back to the carbon accounting. The total project abatement, that means the total amount of CO2 that is stored in the project is about is the balance between the carbon accumulated that's in the living biomass and the below ground biomass, dead biomass and the soil carbon accumulation. And there's another bit in there. This is the baseline. You've also won, you know, or you've also uh, changed the baseline, from the emissions from the baseline, right? So we might have to account for those. And then the carbon lost is the greenhouse gas emissions from your mangrove, which would include CO2, CH4, methane and nitrous oxide, the soil emissions from the project activities. Let's say you had to dig up um, 
you know, to make the project, you had to dig out a bund wall or something, a, a levy. You know, you'd have to have those emissions in there. Fuel emissions, they matter, so you have to count them, uh, subtract those. And then the carbon accumulated in the baseline land uses, if that had occurred, right? So the baseline is important because all carbon projects, and this is an example of the carbon stock change on the on the y-axis and time on the x, you've got this business as usual baseline, and then the influence of the project is 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 the gain that you get on top of the baseline, right? So the baseline could be declining, as in look at this sugarcane field that we've got there. Every year it gets turned over and it loses more carbon to the atmosphere as that soil is degraded further. So that is a negative baseline. It's emitting CO2 and actually it's also emitting methane, right? So then when we do the project and we let the the mangroves established, we are going to add to the carbon in the biomass. We're going to, the soil carbon is going to increase over time and the methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions are going to be reduced, right? So they're all value uh, to the project. Can't tell you enough how important it is to think about your baseline. So don't only think about mangroves, think about the the, the alternative land use as well. Now, in carbon accounting, it's very difficult sometimes to measure methane, nitrous oxide and CO2 emissions directly. These are often expensive techniques. And so sometimes the IPCC values for greenhouse gas emissions from the alternative land uses might be really useful. So in Australia, for example, to characterise that soil carbon loss when you're under grazing or cropping, uh, we use an IPCC default value as that value in our uh, projects. Okay, so this is a bit of baseline measuring. This is um, one of my postdocs in a paddock of weeds, and the plan is to turn this into a mangrove. But we're doing we're measuring the baseline before we get started. We're using surface elevation tables to characterise soil carbon accumulation that might occur, but in fact it's loss because it's subsiding over time. And we've also measured greenhouse gas emissions and above ground biomass to really characterise the baseline. So one of the other really important things that you can do when you start thinking about carbon accounting is review the data that you have and synthesise it. So this picture is from a paper by Oscar Serrano in 2019 when we were trying to make the, well, it was prior to making the blue carbon method for the Australian uh, carbon market. And our first job was really to review all of the information that we have, put it in one place. How much did we have? What was what was missing? You know, we you have to, the, it's a really good idea to assemble the, the data you have, whether it's from the scientific literature or the grey literature or it's held in, you know, government archives. That's an important process to go through because then you need to make a summary to know, like, what you need and what you've got. So I copied this out of an old presentation of mine when we were trying to see what we had for the Australian blue carbon method and the dark green or the darker green bars these ones are the ones that we knew we had data from the Serrano et al. paper that I just looked at. Then the white bars are things we just didn't know whether we had them or not. And then the the black bars were ones that we were like out of scope, right? And these light green ones, we knew we had some data, but not a whole lot, right? So this is a really whack you know, a great way of just trying to characterise what you need to do, you know, which box do you need to invest in to go forward. Okay, so that can, brings us to data sources, right? So I have I've put a few choices here for you. You can use surrogate data, and by that I mean 
data from other sites. So let's say you're in Indonesia and um, you think, oh, I'll just use that value from Malaysia, right, for that box or, you know, or I'll use that that uh, I'll use that data source above ground biomass from that study that happened five hundred you know two hundred kilometers away, right? So the cost of using that kind of data because it's already cl- cl- collected is pretty low, but the uncertainty I would say is moderate to high, right? You don't know how well that site reflects your site. You don't know how similar it is. Let's say you can measure things on site right, especially if you stratify them. We're going to talk about stratification in a minute. The cost is high and the uncertainty is low. You're really confident about that number, right? Then there's a whole range of global data sets out there, global biomass, global soil carbon, even tree growth rates, all sorts of things, right? The cost is low, but, again, the uncertainty is high because you're not quite certain how that site compares to your site, right? And then there's this sort of possibility of using a bit of a mixture of both, right? That's moderate cost, low to moderate uncertainties. So whichever way you go, um, I I think the advice I have really is to verify your approach. So try to do two things, you know, or use a mixed um, uh, possibilities, you know, to basically increase your certainty or decrease your uncertainty and, you know, without increasing your costs of implementation. So uncertainty, we're coming back down to that. It's really um, important and most standards provide guidance on characterising levels of uncertainty and they say what is applicable, right, what they will, what's what's allowed. You know, 90% is sometimes... Um, used. Okay, we'll go. We'll talk about that in a moment. But there's a couple of strategies for reducing uncertainty, and the first one is stratify across across environmental gradients. So important. This is the best way to go about it. So if you've got a big mangrove, split it into bits so that you can reduce your uh, uncertainty by characterizing, let's say, the seaward fringing mangrove and the landward one. We'll go into that in a minute. Increase replication, of course, if you're doing um, on-site um, measurements and also increasing technical proficiency, just making sure that your measurements are good, right? So there's some really helpful resources that are available. I actually love this one from the Red Compass. Uh, they've got a great um, description of uncertainty and how to deal with it. But the Blue Carbon Manual of the Blue Carbon Initiative also has some really great advice. This is the example from VM0033. I keep going back to this one because it's most commonly used. And they have instructions, general instructions on how to stratify and why you stratify uh, your sampling design and then some very specific advice, right? So here we have areas with organic soils. There's actually guidance there on how you would stratify the project, right? But... You know, it says where the project area at the project start date is not homogenous, stratification may be carried out to improve the accuracy and precision of carbon stock and greenhouse gas flux estimates. That's why you do it. Okay, so if you're going to stra- uh, stratify, how do you do that? What's your, you know, what what would be your approach here? You're trying to make or you know, understand relatively homogenous units in the landscape. So I've got this picture here. This is across uh, a mangrove in the north of Australia, and it's actually pretty detailed, and they've identified actually eight strata, right? The seaward fringe, which is sonoratia, uh, sonoratia casularis, the shoreward sort of taller forest, a tidal creek closed forest transition, blah, blah. The big six there is the scrub forest of the higher intertidal, and then there's some hinterland um, ones, right? So that's pretty complicated, eight strata. If it was me doing this for a carbon pro- or for you know carbon project or any other project, I might go for three, right? And I might sort of put all the tall stuff together and put the scrub because it's dominant. If you look at that big yellow bar in the circle below, in one strata and maybe combine some of the others. So 
What's often used to stratify mangrove forests is short tall, fringing, landward. In Indonesia, they use primary forests and secondary forests as their stratification for their greenhouse gas inventory. You could use species if that's appropriate. That might be appropriate in places like the Caribbean where there are a few species. Elevation of the land, sometimes hard to get. And then land use type if you're uh, talking about your baseline. So you might have, you know, gr wet grassland as one baseline, you know, uh, I don't know, what else could rice or grazing land or whatever whatever else. Okay. So tools that might help you. I thought about this a lot. I love this um, global biomass model. Uh, I love it because it's just so interesting to look at <laughs> and to look at places that you know and see if it, um, if, if it matches your understanding of the environment. I don't know whether any of you are going to guess where this one is. But if you look at the two colours on it and you look at the above ground biomass uh, um, legend, you'll see that somewhere in there, those forests somewhere between 70 and 140, maybe 210 tonnes per hectare biomass, right? So that's a big range, you know, and you would need, if you were going to do a project in this area, perhaps to characterise that uh, on the strata of the darker spots and the lighter spots, right? That would help you reduce your uncertainty. But this map certainly gives you a target and shows you sort of like what the variation might be, and that's what's useful, I think. If you look at this as one of my sites, oof, we go from 70 all the way to almost 500 tonnes in this site. We certainly need to stratify this, right, to get good numbers for a biomass I'm talking about here. but. Possibly we should use the same sort of characterization for soil carbon or carbon accumulation if we were going to put in surface elevation tables or another method like that for understanding um, modern or contemporary uh, accumulation. Anyway, okay, that's a good one to look at and it can really help you decide how you might want to stratify uh, your sites um, land use is another one. You can see if I was going to planning to restore on the left of that picture some of that farmland, some of it looks pretty like dodgy to me, uh, dodgy meaning uh, doesn't look like it's particularly uniformly green, might be influenced by sea level rise, let's say salinization or perhaps uh, flooding. So you might want to have a strata that is that paddock, right? Okay, so then we've also got a global soil carbon stock model. Now that's got some pretty big um, uh, tiles. So it's it's been updated. I think now there's a 2023, but that can be also really helpful to decide how you might stratify a site, what your stocks might be. You might accept the high uncertainty um, for the reduced cost, for example. These are things to think about. Okay, and then of course you can um, you can characterize soil carbon accumulation um, using dated sediment cores. Uh, you can use accumulation over a known age. There's a nice example of doing that uh, in Mexico with a, a layer that is uh, comprised of volcanic ash, so a known age in the soil or you can use surface elevation tables. And this is something that I came across recently that somebody told me about. There's something called the Blue Carbon Timescale Network, and they're actually offering to do analyses for free if you could contribute their, your data to them. So anyway, that might be something to look into. Okay, greenhouse gases, it's expensive to do. It's often highly variable. And I think my advice to you is if you don't have that capacity within your um project team, um, that you think about models and other uh, methods or you, you know, link up and create a collaboration with people who do do those sorts of uh, measurements. So, um, you know, you really want to think about strategic sampling. If you're going to go out and try and, you know, characterise some of these parameters that are needed for uh carbon crediting methodologies. So you can use field data 
you know, that you strategically um, gather to train models. You can use remote sensing to identify and map stra strata, and then you can strategically sample over strata, you know, or use existing data that you know is collected over those different categories of land. So you'd scale up using maps of cover of those different strata and um, then you'd verify, you know, test your projections with additional data and sampling. So this is, you know, a pretty common sort of approach to um, building certainty in the uh, amount of carbon that you're storing over time or the amount or the change in carbon over time. So determining um, levels of replication needed to get your targeted level of precision um, is also, you know, clearly articulated in most methods. And this one comes from CDM. It's been reused time and time again. But the inputs are the mean and the variance for the parameter you're interested, let's say above ground biomass for a particular strata, let's say tall mangrove. And then knowing a threshold of uncertainty, i.e. you need to be within the 90% confidence interval of the mean, you can calculate exactly what your replication needs to be, right? So, I mean, these are common tools. It sounds like it's really difficult. It's not you just sort of like work your way uh, through the instructions and there is plenty of instructions, so this is my final slide, actually. I'm at, I'm at like measurements. We haven't even got to how to make measurements. I was trying to get, you know, how much could we stuff in this webinar? And, um, you know, for measurements, I think there is actually tons of guidance out there how you do this, and one of them is the, the manual. And then, you know, over time there's been a big proliferation of online resources and courses if you, um, if you need advice on methods. I suppose... It's good to get with your 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 friendly scientists. Good to make make friends with scientists if you're a carbon if you want to do carbon projects. All right, thanks, Chris. Thank you. I was just getting all of those links. That was great. That's, that's such a nice introduction to carbon accounting and and so many useful links and resources there. So thanks very much. Uh, so feel free, people. I just I should have said at the start. There's a Q&A button down the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can just type a question in there or feel free to put up your hand and I can allow you to speak as well. And while people think, I'll just ask a question. Uh, you, I like your checklist there. You had a, the things you have to think about to define the aims of your project and then that then defines what you do. Is there some sort of checklist published somewhere about that kind of list of things you gave or...? You know what? I don't think there is, Chris. Mm. But maybe there. I mean, the the restoration guidelines are actually mm. pretty good at describing, you know, what you might need to do, right, and what you have to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you, I mean, it's not it's not simple. And if you talk to the experts, so for example, Leah Glass has given a number of. Um, presentations around the place. I love listening to Leah because she explains how, you know, you might have a situation where the VCS is a great choice if you want to do a carbon crediting project, but other places where Plan Vivo is the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. And if you're in Australia, for example, you don't have those two choices, you know. And so it really depends. It's so much of it is about the choice. So when I started to think about this um webinar is like well which bit would I talk to you know and I think that's there's general principles and most of them most of the methods use those general principles but what you exactly need you really need to read those methods yeah so it's good to talk to someone with a high level understanding if you've got a choice of methods oh yeah for sure you really might need be the to. best one for you and then get into the details to understand exactly what you need to do yeah sometimes it's also useful to read um the method the documents that have been produced by projects mm -hmm. and you can see you know like exactly what people 
what has been done before. Some of those are commercial in confidence, and so it's hard to get hold of them. And some of them, I must say, I've read and I thought they didn't do a great job of some of it, right? And I think, um, yeah, but, you know, like it's all about capacity and what you have at your disposal, you know, and then the, the the sort of the standard needs to say, okay, that's not good enough. You need to fix that. And they do go through that process, right? But, you know, it's always better if you do it right the first time. So, um, you know, my advice is to read the project documents, if you can, of somebody else before you embark on it as well. Yeah, it's a good way to understand what they did. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And I put all those links in the chat and I'll also include those with the YouTube video. Uh, yeah. There's a question I might have to ask the person to ask the question to type it again or speak up. I'm having trouble understanding it, but it says, would strategic sampling mean on field sampling for one or two specific sampling? So I think that's about like what I'm trying to get at by strategic okay. sampling. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, if you know what your strata is, let's say you know that you've got, um, uh, let's say you've got a abandoned sugar cane, right, that's mm. one strata, and then the other one is um, grazing land, let's say you, you had those two, right, and you needed to know what the soil stock and the vegetation was to begin with, then like you would you would randomly choose you know three different you know let's say three at a minimum mm. right um areas in those different strata and sample them for soil carbon right and that way you would be able to do a uh, you would you know ca have a mean for each strata that you could scale up over the landscape so to other locations right and that's what i mean by strategic sampling it's just like don't go don't go sampling stuff you don't have to and go sampling the exact units that you are going to use to scale up, right? Mm -hmm. So that means you can build a model, you know, like that's what it's that's what it's all about really is building something that you have enough confidence in that you can extrapolate out to the landscape. Right. Thank you. Uh, now, Amanda, did, you had your hand up. Did you want to speak a bit more to that or? Yeah, uh, it was actually specifically that only. I was actually mm -hmm. looking at, you know, a different zonation. So suppose you have uh, from the seaward side zones one, two, three, four. So I do a very specific sampling in zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, and then I can extrapolate that to all the zones that I may have. Well, to other locations that are those similar zones that you would, uh, that you've identified, yes. So let's say your project is 1,000 hectares and, of course, you're only going to sample over a small proportion of those, but you're going to get, you know, let's say five samples from zone one, five from zone two, whatever. And then if you if they're relatively homogenous, then you would use that to extrapolate out over the rest of the 1,000 hectares um, uh, proportionally by zone. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted. Uh, you know, that's what yeah. the question was actually. Right. Good. Thank you. That question. That question. <laughs> yes, it is. Because uh, you really yeah. don't want to waste your resources. Yeah, yeah. Um, so another question, do the standards or scientific recommenda recommendations prescribe the number of samples needed per hectare? So, yeah, what do they say about replication specifically, I guess? They say the the replication you would determine by using those tools that say like you want to get to within the ninety percent confidence intervals for the mean, right? And so from some preliminary data, let's say you know what the mean and the standard deviation is, you can of the of the value, then you can use those tools that will tell you exactly the replication you need to to use to get to that level of uncertainty or certainty. Right. So that CDM, um, you know, uh, method is really what you use to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that one of the links that you shared, those tools? Uh, I think it was just a um, it was just a screen grab from the CDM method. But actually in the VM0033, 
they have exactly the same thing, mm-hmm. you know. So it's it's a common um, tool that's out there to okay. establish what sort of level of replication you need. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so any carbon standard would specify the tool. So if you were looking yeah, at exactly. that, find the tool. Exactly. Okay. Well, in Australia, you know, we use a carbon method. Our method is actually a model, so nobody has to measure anything except change in area. Mm. And that's because we've just decided in our setting where labour costs are huge and mangroves and other wetlands can be extremely remote, that we are happy to model it and we've got enough data over the country to be reasonably confident in the result, right? So... For us, our sample was taken around Australia. We used everything that we had and we made a model that said, if you're in southeast Queensland and you're growing a mangrove, you're going to get this many tonnes per hectare and we are pretty confident that that's the case. And then our method is also very conservative. So it's Mm. unlikely we're going to overcredit. In fact, it's more likely we're going to undercredit you. But the good thing about it is that you don't have to measure anything. Mm. So it's like pluses and minuses. When you measure, you've got to get a more accurate understanding of how much carbon you've stored. Mm. But if you, you know, don't measure, then there's a risk of under or over crediting, which might be okay. Um, but sometimes some of these methods, they also um, put a penalty on higher levels of uncertainty. So. Mm-hmm. You know, they do try and undercredit. Yeah. Uh, just to be to, conservative. That, I guess, brings me to the cost side of it. Do you want to just speak more generally about the cost of collecting these samples and how much of an impediment do you think that is to developing new carbon projects and getting this conservation to happen? I don't, I actually think um, the cost of measurements, you know, can be high. I mean, if you start talking about doing um, carbon, you know, accumulation of uh, soil, like you're doing lead 210, that's very high. But I think actually measuring biomass is just not that bad, right, Mm. especially if as a method you only have to measure it every five years. Um, You know, and then you accept that perhaps your soil carbon, you could undercredit because you didn't measure it because it's too hard to measure and too expensive to measure. So I think there's a whole lot of sort of, um, um, you know, variation in the costs, Mm. right? I actually think... flexibility there. Yeah, there is quite a lot of flexibility depending on the method that you use and and where you are. I mean, yeah, in Australia it is expensive to get people out there measuring, you know, but you really only have to do it every five years. Mm. But... For some reason here in Australia, everybody was like, oh, no, we don't want to do that. That's too hard. Um, <laughs> but in other places, it's a, it's part of the work mm-hmm. of caring for the mangrove. Mm-hmm. And in those cases, I would say it's totally worth it, mm-hmm. you know. Right. Um, just another question. Would no data be better than high uncertainty data? I guess that means no data means using tier one or modelled estimates. Yeah, I still I think our models are actually getting so good um, that I think uh, it's it, I think it's better to use the global data than no data. <laughs> I think that's going to get you closer, and um, high uncertainty will come with a penalty, uh, you know, in terms of the carbon credit mm. that you would obtain. Yeah, it's, it's, I was interested that you showed one of your study sites and um, I think it was the global biomass model. How accurate is that compared to what you know of that study site? You know, you said there was like it's pretty, up there. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah. There was like yeah, a hot spot on the bend of a river. And, <laughs> yeah. And that's those huge rhizophora forests, you know, like they're 25, 30 metres tall and mm-hmm. they're in particular parts of the river. But most of the mangrove is actually this very short seriop scrub. Mm. You know, so it's actually really good. I oh, I like it. Differentiating but, those two different um, zones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well. So if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to do a restoration, you know what that forest is going to, you have to assume that it's going to look like a forest that's nearby, right? Mm. So, you know, somehow you have to 
understand what your site might be in the future and you would use, you know, perhaps elevation there previously if mm. somebody is an expert, but you would use your control or the, the next, that that site that hasn't been, you know, cleared, that's in a most in a relatively natural so- state to measure, to basically know or project where you're heading in 25 years. Mm. You know, because most carbon projects, you have to project what you expect to gain. So if that's restoration, you have to basically assume what your forest is going to get to in 25 or 30 years, right? Mm. If it's a conservation project, you need to know how much carbon is going to be, you know, would be lost if it was destroyed. So that's sort of like an, I don't know, go and measure the the forest as it is. Great. That actually brings me to another question. Any other questions before I go on? Because we're sort of coming close to time. So uh, any last questions? Did, did you have one, Tom? I'm sort of putting your hand up. Yeah. Um, so there's, in the media, there's been quite a lot of pushback on carbon projects. Um particularly around these ideas of additionality and, and leakage and, you know, how much things are changing relative to the bi- baseline. Um, That's for like how, an avoided, avoided loss project rather than a restoration project, you mean? Well, it was for both, really. Yeah. So um, there's the aspects of, you know, how much are you changing something relative to what the baseline was or what it was going to be into the future? And how much are you moving production, say, of aquaculture to different locations and, and what implications does that have? How, how well do you think that's captured in um, blue carbon projects at the moment? I think, uh, well, how well? You know, we are going to be under scrutiny in the future. I think there's so there's not enough projects yet uh, scrutinised, you know, in a you know, the way they can scrutinise all of the projects across the the tropical rainforest because there's so many, right? You know, we actually just still don't have that many blue carbon projects that we can really look at. We've had failed restoration, right? But, you know, we would hope that blue carbon projects, restoration, uh, done a lot better because of, you know, increases in our knowledge and the knowledge of the community over time, right? So I think that sort of scrutiny is probably going to come to us. Community have benefited greatly from what has happened in the terrestrial environment. And in fact, I think we are holding ourselves to higher standards, mostly. We are held to higher standards than the terrestrial projects were to begin with, right? And you know, we've worked to a higher standard. And I think, you know, even with the like the um the best practice guidelines for blue carbon projects, talking about safeguards particularly and those sorts of things. And I think our as a community, our attention to doing good projects, you know, might slow adoption, but could be very beneficial in the end when all of these projects come under scrutiny. Are they real abatement? Have they really reduced CO2 to the atmosphere, right? So that m- the more sustainable we can make these projects by doing good projects with, you know, community, the better it's going to be in the long run. I really, as our lesson from from the terrestrial projects. And the better it will be for the, rest, the reputation of, I guess, mangrove projects in general. And and is yeah. you you mentioned for the Australian um an initiative that maybe one approach is to under under credit or be more, more conservative with about the credits you hang it uh, up being put forward. Is that kind of one approach that might help yeah, us be more kind of confident about? Yeah, I mean it can help, but the flip side is that nobody wants to do it because they don't feel like they get enough out of it, right? So there's a very fine balance. Probably something, Chris, that a modeler like you could take on <laughs> and understand where the thresholds of those careful versus being too, you know, not careful enough where the yeah. penalty, you know, where the sweet spot lies. 
because I, I was at a meeting last week and people are doing projects and they're like, I mean, there's going to be so much more carbon there than your model is going to give us. And I'm like, it's not my model. But then, I, you know, but the argument is, well, because the government made it like that because they wanted us in the 40th percentile because they want to undercredit because they know that some product projects could be overcredited. So they're sort of looking at this landscape scale. We want to land on the mean. Some are going to be a bit over, some are going to be a bit under, but we want them all more under than we want them over, mm -hmm. you know, because they don't want the Guardian writing, um, you know, articles to say that all of these blue carbon projects are nonsense. Hmm. Well, <gasps> thanks for that broad perspective, Kath. I mean, I haven't heard that before, so it's really interesting to know about the history and why we think mangrove carbon credits might be more robust than has happened in the rainforests. Um, yeah. Much to go. Yep, it's been, a, it's been an hour now. So thanks so much for spending time with us and explaining carbon accounting to our Global Mangrove Alliance community. And, um, yep. No props. And I just remind people that we'll have another webinar coming on again soon. Our next one, we might have a carbon, another carbon one coming up or the next one might be about policy, depending on which team I get in first. And a reminder to check out the YouTube channel where we have our past webinars, include everything from Global Mangrove Watch, um, remote sensing, pollution in mangroves and community engagement, engagement in mangrove conservation. So thanks for joining us today. Bye, everyone.